YouTube. What we're going to talk about today is a little bit of living history. Uh, this is kind of a companion video to the one I did on building your persona for classic camping. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with living history, uh, this talks about what we call pocket trash. Now, this is stuff that we carry in our pockets that may or may not uh, become useful while talking to the public as an interpreter. And if you go to the video on coming to terms with living history, you'll learn what those, those terms mean. Yeah. But it's also something <coughs> excuse me, that you can use just to build your impression for yourself same way I talk about uh, building your persona. Something that not everybody needs to know. You don't actually have to show the stuff that's in your pocket if you don't want to. But it's a kind of a tactile thing. Something we can touch that reminds us of who we are in history as opposed to who we are today. So what we're going to do here is talk about pocket trash. Let's let the old man talk. Let's take a look at what's in my pocket. My bandana, my match safe, pocket knife, my hobo knife, a cigarette lighter, a change purse, and my pocket watch. Let's take a closer look at the contents of the change purse. Okay, so what does the contents of my pockets tell you about the person that I am? First thing, shows that when I go outdoors, when I go in the woods, I have been in the woods long enough to know that I should carry at least two different methods of starting a fire. Okay, whether I go out day hiking or whether I'm going out in the woods for a week, I should always carry two methods of starting a fire. And if you looked at my uh, Fixin' Two videos, you'll know that I've got one of these in my haversack and I've got one of these in my uh, chuck box. These keep my strike anywhere matches dry just in case the fuel in my lighter dries out, okay? I also would carry a flint and steel, but only for emergencies. Too many people today think that is the primary means of starting a fire, and it's just not. That's your last resort. Okay, two other things I want to focus on is the bandana and the pocket knife. Now first on the bandana. Until about the early 1970s, most men and boys carried either a handkerchief or a bandana in their pocket. The further you go along in the 20th century, the 
less prevalent the bandana because and a bandana what a bandana is is a great big handkerchief okay living in texas uh, this would have been something I would have used in my youth in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, riding on the plains. So it would be something that would be in common use. Until the, uh, the, the late 70s, most men, whether they were outdoorsmen or not, carried a pocket knife. Now, because I'm going to spend some time outdoors and I may need uh, something to eat with, I've chosen a, a hobo knife that's got a fork and a spoon on it as well as, as a knife, okay? That's my form of carrying a knife on me. This, these are two things that, that, that are no longer done by men today, carrying a pocket knife and uh, a handkerchief or bandana, okay? Thousand and one uses for, for a handkerchief or a bandana, not just for, for wiping snot off your nose. A bandana can cover your mouth in case of any kind of dust. You can use it to cover your head if the sun is too bright. I once uh, came across a guy who was writing a book on different kinds of camping gear, and when he got to the uses of uh, bandanas and handkerchiefs, uh, he stopped at about a thousand and one. Okay? So, culturally, we can make that distinction with these pockets, with this, with this pocket trash, okay, the bandana and the knife. We can make that contrast, but there's something else we can use with this money, okay. This is a silver dollar, five dollar gold piece, two dimes, and three pennies, okay? First thing we can tell people is this six dollars and twenty-three cents represents about a week's income prior to 1933, okay? A man in my station uh, living on a military pension, yeah, I'm gonna make about six and a half dollars a week, okay? and it would be paid to me monthly, but most people who were working for wages, the average wage was somewhere around $25 to $30 a month. Some people made more than that, some people made less than that, but $6 is about the average. Okay, now, the one I want to focus on, the thing I want to focus on, the thing that is unique about the 1930s and something that may help us understand what is going on in our economy today is this, a $5 gold piece. Now let's talk a little bit about that, okay? And I'll tell you, my favorite guy on YouTube, my favorite living history guy on YouTube is a fellow named Peter Kelly uh, who has a uh, YouTube channel called The Woodlands Escape. And every time he goes into one of these spiels, like what I'm about to talk to you here, he says he wants to tell you about a wee bit of history. Okay? And that's what I want to do. I want to talk about a wee bit of history using this $5 gold piece. Let's get into it. Okay, now first off, those of you who are interested in acquiring some of this change here, I got this from uh, Logsdon and Company, uh, Nathaniel Logsdon's website. These are all reproductions, but they are excellent reproductions. Somewhere on the surface, on one side or the other of all of these coins, is a very small stamping that says copy, so that they can't be sold as, as collectibles. But these are very, very good. Everything is dated in the early 20th century, about 1908, 1910, which is, you know, uh, people would have uh, currency like this, change like this in their pockets, uh, dated to the early 20th century uh, for a good long while. I can tell you I once picked up a, a dime dated 1910 when I was a teenager uh, in the 1970s. Okay, that's how long coins stay in cir circulation. So that's where I got those. Now, 
The other thing I want to tell you is what, what we're going to discuss here is very general. I am not an economist. I'm not even a professional historian. I'm an amateur, and I've been at it for a while. So this is very general, and it should serve as a jumping-off point for your own research. Okay? But, in 1913, Congress created the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, this was uh, in response to a number of financial crises that happened in the 19th and early 20th century uh, that basically created a new kind of currency for the United States called the Federal Reserve Note. We call it the dollar. Okay? And it was paper money. Okay? The idea was, uh, the problems that they were having was the currency, the money we had, wasn't elastic. You would have a bank fail, and there wouldn't be enough dollars, there wouldn't be enough money to cover the deposits, and there was no way for, for the people responsible to get that much currency, even though they had something to back it up with. You understand what I'm saying there? Sometimes the problem was, is that there was way too much money, okay? And this causes prices to rise called inflation, you're living it now. Okay? In 1913, the Federal Reserve Board was created in order to uh, centralize banking in this country. And as part of that legislation, they required that they could not issue any more currency equal to, uh, they, they had to hold 40% of the currency in circulation had to be in gold. Okay? To, to oversimplify it, if there was a, a million dollars in currency, they had to have $400,000 worth of gold. Okay? In 1929, the stock market crashed. And in 1932, the bottom fell out of the economy. Prices started going down, wages started going down, unemployment reached 25 percent. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was uh, elected as a result and he instituted a number of programs that addressed the symptoms of the depression because he could not solve the problem of the Depression. Okay, now this required a lot more money than was in circulation. And they were hampered by the fact that 40% of the money in circulation had to be held as gold by the government. So one of the first things he did was issue an executive order using powers given to him by Congress when he uh, was elected that required every citizen who held on, who had in their possession gold money or bullion or gold certificates had to turn them over to the government in return for Federal Reserve notes. You understand what I'm saying? After 1933, it was illegal for me to have this $5 gold piece in my pocket. I had to have a $5 bill. Okay? This is why a man with my history, a 70-year-old man in Texas in 1932, this is why I've got a handful of change in a very small change purse instead of carrying my money in a billfold. Because after experiencing all of the financial panics of the 19th and early 20th century, I don't trust folding money. I trust hard money. Okay? I trust silver dollars. They're made with real silver. 
there is a dollar's worth of silver in a silver dollar. A dollar's worth back in the day. There is five dollars worth of gold, actual, real, honest-to-goodness gold, in the five-dollar gold piece. Okay? So as part of my living history persona, prior to 1932, I carry more change, more hard money on my person than I do folding money. Okay? Now, we're experiencing some banking problems today. And that is because there is too much money in circulation. Okay? Take a look at what is said here that I'm about to post. What the government was trying to do when they took all that gold. Yes. They believed that they could control inflation. And, for the most part, the government does control inflation. Okay? Inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods, which makes the prices of everything rise. And it makes your money worth less. Okay, every time the government puts more money into circulation, prices go up, your money is worth less. Now normally, under normal circumstances, inflation is only about 2 to 3 percent a year. That's not a big damn deal. Okay, but when the government injects a whole bunch of money, all at once, things go wrong. Okay even though the government thinks they can control it, they don't pay attention to the lessons of history. And that's why it's important for you and I to take the material culture of the time, the things that we can touch and feel. We can pass around this $5 gold piece, this $1, this silver dollar, we can pass around, let people touch it, and let them get a connection with what went on before to help them understand what is going on today. Okay? Okay, like I said, I'm not an economist. That is very general explanation. But it's something you can transmit to people, and I do hope that it serves as a jumping-off point for your own research. Okay? In the meantime, we're going to keep looking for more stuff to show you in the history of gear. We're going to make a couple more things. I am going to uh, uh, show, do one more uh, make-your-own-gear project before I go out uh, with uh, on a camping trip using nothing but the gear we have made in the past year here. And, of course, as I mentioned in the last video, we've got a few more sleeping bag videos coming out. So, if this, uh, if, if this channel, if my blathering uh, entertains you, informs you, educates you, uh, please like the channel, please uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, Please share these videos in social media sites uh, that you visit uh, with people <coughs> who have similar, ish, uh, similar interests in history, particularly classic camping, the camping of the, first, of the 20th century. Okay? All of this helps people find this YouTube channel. I thank you for watching. I thank you for watching all the way through. There will be links to the two videos I mentioned earlier at the end of this, and uh, we'll see you down the trail.
Thank you.